Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me and especially to my patrons and channel members. I have a very special guest with us today. Today we have Richard Carrier. Welcome, Richard Carrier. Hi, Good. glad to be here. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things to get started with. Um, I normally take questions and comments as they come, but because of Dr. Carrier drawing a much larger audience than I'm used to and him having a very limited amount of time, I am going to save all questions until the last 15 minutes of the show. I might possibly take one earlier if we have a pause and it's right on topic with what we're talking about at the moment. But for the most part, if you have a question, I'll be saving that toward the end. Uh, preference will be given to Super Chats and channel members and patrons. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Carrier. Um, first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about your background, your work, and how you came to be where you are today. Yeah, I mean, how I came to be here is that's a really long story. Uh, that'd be a whole show <laughs> unto itself. But you know, it starts way back in the '90s um, mm. when I became an atheist in the military, and and then that started my quest for well, if religions aren't true, then what is? And so mm. I was very focused on figuring out a philosophy of life, and then also methodology, like how do we know? anything that we do. How do we know what, what is true and whatnot? Uh, so methodology and factuality were very big on that. And, and then I was getting much, I was, that was my first encounter with Christian apologetics and my first real eye opening with the, 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 how it proceeds often very dishonestly, lots of disinformation, uh, lots of bad thinking, etc. cetera. Uh, and so I got very involved in that. And then through the course of, you know, after the military, I went to college, um, and then realize uh, I was really excited by history. I didn't expect that to be the case, but in college, mm. that's what uh, attracted me. Um, that's a whole other story as to why that happened. Uh, and then especially the Roman civilization uh, mm -hmm. unit uh, really uh, struck me. I really was fascinated by this culture and wanted to study it. And then I realized I could do double duty with that. So uh, that would give me the languages and background to do good counter apologetics for the atheist community. So. Uh, I pursued a PhD all the way to the Columbia, Columbia University PhD in ancient history uh, and have always, you know, up till then and since been very much involved in counter apologetics and helping people understand how history works, understand historical facts and things like that. Uh, so they can't be bamboozled by, you know, Christian apologists misrepresenting things or getting things wrong. That's interesting because it is actually history that caused me to become an atheist as well. And I'm going to reserve that for later if we get to it. But first... Right I'd like to start out with my favorite historical issue, which is the Quirinius problem. Um, and I have a copy of your book, Homer, Hitler, Bible, Christ, that I keep on my coffee table and reference every time I get into this problem. <laughs> uh, because every time somebody comes up with some kind of historical Roman fact I wasn't aware of, and I'm well, I, I wasn't aware of that. And so I go back and re-reference that as to how to address that particular part of the problem. Uh, for those of you who might not, not be aware, the Quirinius problem is that Luke's gospel says that Quirinius was governor and uh, was taking a census, which was the vehicle that he used to move Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. But the problem is that Quirinius wasn't governor until 6 CE. And Herod died in 4 BC, so that leaves a 10-year gap in which Jesus could not be born. Tell us yeah. a little bit about uh, the, the conflict and, and how Roman history takes uh, precedence in that. Yeah, that's a really good example. It's one that I'm actually like a really good expert on because I studied all the apologetic arguments, like all of them, and there's a zillion of them, right? Like attempts to get these two facts to reconcile. How do you get Matthew and Luke to be the same date? There's, it's... A lot of twisting of history and a lot of assertions that that aren't factual but represented as factual uh, so there's a lot of things yeah and you i get questions from a lot of people who will be have some facts thrown at them well did you know about this and this and this this explains the whole thing and they go well is any of that true and it'd be because it'd be like really obscure things how would you know like you know so uh so that's uh, i put all of my research into hitler homer bible christ where people can find it uh, on this question uh, and yeah, there's lots of examples of, of things like that. Um, but yeah, there, there isn't any way to get them to reconcile. But they'll, they'll make a lot of arguments like, for instance, well, maybe Quirinius was governor of Syria twice. Yeah. And, right. That's that's a common one. But then you, that people wouldn't know that actually the Roman Empire never did that. There was never a governor of the same province twice. There's an actual ah. autocratic reason for that. Like you don't want 
and also they had limited tenures. So like three years usually was the max, uh, maybe a little more sometimes, but not much. You wanted to move these guys around and not let them build a base of power in a particular province because then they might start a civil war, right? Might try to assert the throne. Challenge so Caesar. they moved these people around. They always changed and rotated the governors and never sent them back. They always had a new governor. Uh, and, and you can look at the history of the governors of Syria and see that. Like we, we know most of the governors of Syria for a very long period of time. And you can see they're never duplicated. And you can look at this in other provinces as well. But yeah, you would have to know, like, uh, get at the peer-reviewed literature. You'd have to, like, study, you know, Roman political history. And, like, there's a lot of, like, deep knowledge you would need to know that this claim is bogus. But, of course, what a Christian apologist will do is just make the claim, you know, hoping no one will check, because they didn't check if it's true or not. They just make the claim. And then, of course, they build their entire argument off of that. And there's a lot of other examples where they do that. Conflating a census with uh, an, an oath, for example, are not at all the same thing. They didn't operate the same way and so on. It wouldn't be described the way Luke does and so on. Uh, so, yeah, there's a zillion of these. We could do a, a whole show just on that. And, yes, Travis, I, I realize that Dr. Carrier's mic is crackling. Um, no. I don't know that there's anything I can do about that. I don't know if there's anything you can do about that either. What does crackling mean exactly? We just hear kind of a... a, a, a odd sound when you're talking it's hmm. hold on let me try something here does that make any difference so, just, just um, yeah right, let's see if that made any difference i don't it's it's a little better it's a little okay. better yeah yeah it might have been the stand that i had the uh, ipad on yeah that is definitely better <clears throat> okay. okay good I'm glad we solved that all right Okay. Um, yeah. One of the biggest thing I usually run into is people saying, well, oh, oh, I should say, I shouldn't say the biggest, but a new one that I ran into just today was, well, maybe Caesar asked Quirinius to oversee the census, even though he wasn't actually governor then. And we know that this is not historically possible because of where he was. Go ahead and explain that. Yeah, I mean, first of all, there wouldn't be a census, right? Because uh, it wasn't a province yet. That's the thing. <laughs> uh, so usually what you find is the argument, well, sometimes the Romans took censuses of lands that they weren't ruling. Um, that's false. That never happened. So, uh, And then they'll cite some examples, but when you check the examples, those are actual Roman provinces and so on. So uh, yeah, that, so th this is what they'll do. They'll just make up armchair explanations, hope no one checks, because uh, they are hard to check, right? Uh, but the truth is, yeah, the, there would be no census. If there was a census of Syria, and there would have been, there would have been many censuses of Syria before that, they wouldn't affect Judea because Judea was not in Syria at the time. So it, it wasn't a part of the Roman province. It wouldn't be subject to census. One of the important things is Josephus makes a big point of the fact that this census, the Quirinius census in 6 AD, and he dates it to 6 AD. It's, he explains that's when Judea became a Roman, joined Syria as a Roman province, and the Romans took over because they deposed uh, the, the kings at the time. Uh, and it was the first census of Judea under the Romans. This was a big deal. And Josephus talks about like this led to start the start of some key rebel movements that would eventually lead to the Jewish war. And so like this is a huge important event. So obviously you can't just casually say that they were the censuses were taken earlier than that, like that this would like not make any sense in the context of history as we know it. So um Let's see, there was something you said just a moment ago. Oh, I know it was. Josephus uh, specifically said that this was the first census of Quirinius? Uh, first census of Judea, right? So, first, okay. Uh, and yeah, because uh, Judas the Galilean was one of the leading rebels who was stirred up by this. Like, the, how dare the Romans come in and take a census of us, right? And so uh, it led to the, the rise of the zealot movement that would eventually lead to the Jewish war. So that, that's that's his point. Um, it wasn't the first census of Syria, mind you. It was the first census, first Roman census of Judea. Okay, okay. Um, are there any other historical issues that you find in the Gospels? Yeah, um, quite a few. Uh, generally, the Gospels, like most ancient fiction, do a pretty good job of emulating the reality of the time. Uh, that, because that you could, public libraries were free. Uh, in all major cities. So you could go and research historical facts, geographical facts. It wasn't difficult to get those details right in fiction you were writing or mythology that you're writing. Mm, uh, but there, there are, yeah, people often don't realize that. I talk about this in my book, uh, The Scientist. Well, actually, the libraries is in science education in the early Roman Empire. And I talk about 
the ubiquity of public libraries and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so that's how people could easily, people who are writing uh, compositional literature like the Gospels, for instance, that's a very high level of education. Once you're at that level of education, the library is your oyster. You could go in and read anything and get any, any information that you wanted. Um, but nonetheless, there are some anachronisms in the Gospels. Um, one of which is that the Pharisees are not realistic. Um, and there have been some books written about the fact that many of the positions Jesus takes against the Pharisees were mm -hmm. actually the positions of the Pharisees, right? And so, um, and there were two groups of Pharisees. There were conservatives and liberals. And the liberals followed the school of Hillel, and the conservatives followed the school of Shammai. Um, the Hillelites were the dominant sect. Uh, most legal rulings followed Hillelite decisions. Most, the majority of your average Sanhedrin would be Hillelite. Uh, and the rabbinical teachings after that would survive the Jewish war and become the Talmud and so on are, are very Hillelite, although they'll mention Shammai rulings. Uh, and the Shammites were the hyper-conservatives. Uh, and so when, for example, when Jesus is saying, well, you know, obviously you can do good on the Sabbath, so healing on the Sabbath doesn't break the Sabbath. And the Pharisees are like poo-pooing him, like, how dare you heal on the Sabbath? Like that breaks the Sabbath. Only Shammites would be making that argument. Hillelites mm. would be on Jesus' side. So most of the Pharisees in the room would be walking over to Jesus' side and arguing with the Pharisees with him in, in those arguments. But the gospel is depicted as though the Pharisees are all Shammites and Jesus is somehow uniquely coming up with these ideas that are actually Hillelite Pharisee teachings. Uh, and so that, that whole depiction is completely ahistorical. It's an anachronism. It's an oversimplification. And it was designed to kind of create this like sort of straw man, the, the Pharisees, as the conservatives, the conservative Jews that... Christians are positioning themselves as the liberals against the conservatives. Uh, and so they basically straw man all Pharisees as Shamites. Uh, and without saying that they're doing that, right? They just say the Pharisees and it's always just Jesus. None of the Pharisees are helping Jesus out in these arguments. Uh, so that's a historical. That's an example of some, a fiction they wanted to, deplay, to display to sell their gospel that defies history. And, I, and I'm pretty sure that the authors of these books would have known that. It would be highly unlikely that they would not know this that they're depicting the Pharisees unrealistically, like, but they chose to do that for whatever reason, for their dogmatic sort of propagandistic reasons. That's what they chose to do. Um, that's one example. Um, How did the Sanhedrin fit in there? So the Sanhedrin is a, is a court uh, and there's greater ah. Sanhedrins, like, which is like that's like the Supreme Court. And then there's like lower Sanhedrins, lesser Sanhedrins. Uh, and the, the, so like the smallest Sanhedrin was three people. Uh, I think there was a, a, a middle court that was 23. And the greater Sanhedrin, which would be the big Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, which is the one that, that you know Jesus and Paul mostly interact with, uh, would be 70, 71, I think 71 uh, judges. And these would be elders. Um, they were predominantly Pharisees, but not always. There were some Sadducees that would end up uh, on the Sanhedrin. But it was basically like how you got into the Sanhedrin is a whole other story. Like it, it's not a democratic system, for instance. But uh, but yeah, it would just basically just respected elders would end up being chosen to to fulfill these roles, and and so they would often disagree on points of legal principle. Um, but but that's that's what we're talking about. So so it, there are a lot of Pharisees in the Sanhedrin, uh, and there are other sects, by the way. That, that people assume that there's a the Gospels mention the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Mm -hmm. um, other texts will mention the Essenes, uh, which are bizarrely absent from the Gospels. That's another historical anachronism. There would have been way more Essene interaction if, if these are real stories. Uh, but there are actually some 10 to 20 other sects, mm -hmm. right? Like minor sects. Christianity is one of them, but there are many others, right? And mm -hmm. we have an example. Uh, and, and even the Essenes were split into nine different sects. So even the Essenes, oh, wow. like, just like the Pharisees had two sects, the Shamites and the Hillelites, the Essenes had like a zillion sects, right? Uh, so there's, there's actually a lot more sectarianism in Judaism before the Jewish war, right? When when Christianity is depicted as being launched. Uh, but all these other minor sects are not present. There was even a Galilean sect, specifically a Galilean sect. So it's really weird that that doesn't show up in the gospels, which take place so much in Galilee. Like where are the Galilean sect, sectarian rabbis? Like where, why aren't they in any of these arguments? Why are the Jerusalem Pharisees over in Galilee arguing with Jesus? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, it's not impossible. It's just a little weird. Um, okay. So that, that's an example of what I mean. And, and another really important one is that the trial and crucifixion sequence is completely ahistorical in terms of the legal principles involved. Um, ah. We have this from the Mishnah. The Mishnah shows, for instance, uh, that capital trials, if, if, you're, if death penalty was on the table, mm -hmm. they had to take place over two days, right? So you have, basically had to be able to sleep on it and have, a, have continue the trial the next day before a ruling. Uh, and you couldn't have trials at night. 
uh, trials had to occur during the day specifically so you could sleep on it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they had, they had all the mechanisms, oh, and not on a high holy day. So, right, so like the, the Passover started, they're not gonna have a trial, right? Um, and even if the Sabbath is looming, they're not, they're not gonna, and, oh, and you couldn't, you couldn't split the days. So, uh, so if there was a Sabbath coming, like if it was the day before the Sabbath, you could not start a capital crimes trial. You had to start it after so that you could run the two days. And that means what they would have done in, in reality, if, if they had captured Jesus on the day before a Sabbath or much less the day before, you know, much more a day before the Passover, um, they would have just put him in jail, right? They would just held him over and then uh, Sunday morning, they would have started the trial. That's, that's what would have actually have happened. Um, but, but yeah, so, but because the gospels want this to take place at Passover, they want there to be, uh, there's a particular reason they want a, a Sabbath to be involved. Um, there's reasons why they want the chronology to work. They forced the story in there. And then they have all these things that don't make sense, like the trial at night, a trial that takes only one day, uh, you know, all of these things that don't actually make sense uh, in terms of how the, the legal system works and the Jewish legal system works at the time. So, and that's another example. For people who are interested in that, by the way, I go into this in, I did the article on crucifixion quake. There was this guy who did a documentary trying to argue that we have scientific proof that the crucifixion during the, or the, earthquake during the crucifixion actually happened um it it doesn't we don't have evidence of that but he wrote this whole, he did this whole documentary and i wrote an article about it and in there i have a section on how do we date the crucifixion and and why did the gospel authors choose to push it onto certain dates that they wanted and there's actual theological reasons that it's not historical reasoning um so th those are two examples of like historical anachronisms in the gospels okay very good very good, thank you. Now I understand you are a mythicist, is that correct? Yeah, I think it's more probable than not that there wasn't really a Jesus. Uh, I don't think it's impossible or implausible that okay. there was a historical Jesus. Um, in fact, I've, I've talked about what I think is the most plausible model of a historical Jesus. But I just think the balance of evidence pushes in the other direction. We should not be so confident uh, that there was a historical Jesus. And, and yeah, I've published books on this and, and so forth talking about it okay and is your position that that all of the jesus stories were just legends or do you think they're legends about various people that kind of got merged into one or or what is your yeah. position um so when it started there weren't really very many stories about jesus it was mostly a theological concept and it was mostly built out of what's called a pesher where you you find random passages in scripture put them together and you create a story this it's like a hidden message that god has hidden in scripture and we have examples of these pressures from the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, where they, they t find random verses, connect them together and create this sort of secret story. Uh, and so most of what was believed about Jesus was based on that. And for people who want to see this in action, just read the, look at the epistle First Peter in the New mm -hmm. Testament. That is a pressure where he just goes through, and supposedly this is Peter who is supposedly there, right? But all his information is just quotations of scripture. Everything he knows about the crucifixion, it's just scripture. So it's, 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 that's a pressure about Jesus. Uh, and that looks more like the, the there probably have been a more extensive pressure than that, but that's a good example of how it's all coming out of scripture. There's no history there. There's no like oral lore. There's not really any stories, but, uh, later when, when, particularly after the Jewish war, at least the first we hear of stories is like the gospel of Mark and Mark is reacting to the Jewish war. This is a big deal for various reasons. That takes place in the year 70, so now we're like 40 years after the religion began. And it looks like Mark may have been the first to create one of these narratives, right? Putting Jesus in Galilee, having him go on adventures and stuff, interact with historical people, and then get crucified by Romans just outside of Judea, or just outside of Jerusalem. Uh, he seems to be the first, in my opinion, I think he's the first to tell that story. And then the, all the other stories are just riffing on that. They either just copy straight from it or borrow ideas from it and add their own and so on, which was very common. We have other examples of this, the lives of Aesop are an example of just completely made up stories. And then people come along and rewrite them and add stuff and take stuff away. And it's just with the multiple lives of Aesop are very similar to the synoptic gospels in that regard. So, uh, so that's what I think actually happened. Now, the qu your question would then be like, well, what about the character that ends up in the gospels? Did they use any historical people for that? Uh, and I think, Mostly no, but sometimes yes. Mostly what they're using are mythical people. So there's a ton of examples of how stories in the Gospels are just rewritten stories of Moses, where Jesus is being basically the new Moses, uh, rewritten stories of Elijah and Elisha. So, Jesus, so they're using these old myths 
to come up with stories for Jesus and they're just updating them into a new culture, the current culture, modern ideas and so forth. Um, so, and there's been a lot of literature on that. And this is actually fairly mainstream. Uh, this is not a controversial thing to say, like most uh, biblical scholars agree that this is what's going on a lot in the gospels. Um, <clears throat> now one can also argue, I think there's good evidence for some pagan models being used. I think Aesop is a model. Um, uh, Romulus is a model. Uh, Odysseus has been argued to be a model. Uh, there's a pushback against that. I think the evidence is pretty strong for it. Um, but you don't really need to like hang your hat on that because the Moses and Elijah stuff is pretty well, well established. So um, it is interesting and important, I think, to look at how pagan models are being used as well. So I don't think that should be neglected, but I don't think you need to like hit anybody over the head with it uh, necessarily. So there, there, there'll be too much pushback, whereas you can survive on the Moses Elijah argument because so many mainstream scholars have already established that as mainstream. Um, but there are occasional exceptions to that. So um, there is a there's and this is also in the peer reviewed literature, and I talk about it in my book on the historicity of Jesus, um, which is uh, this hi this hypothesis that there are, in the crucifixion narrative it's structured around about twenty points of fact that happen in a particular order, and all of those points and their order are identical for an actual person who's also named Jesus, uh, but has no connection to Christianity, and that's Jesus Ben Ananias who. Uh, he flourished in the 60s AD, ended up being killed. He was killed by the Romans, but by Roman artillery, uh, catapult, uh, uh, stone crushed him. Um, but apart from the actual mechanism of death, uh, it is the Romans that ultimately kill him. And, and so all there's 20 points that all line up. There's like one thing that flips, uh, one storyline that flips to the opposite, uh, which is actually another common thing that happens in mimesis, this sort of emulation of stories. Uh, and so it does look like this story of Jesus Ben Ananias was used to structure the crucifixion narrative of Jesus. Many of the odd features of it, um, the fact that he gets bounced around between the Romans and the Jews, uh, and, and the kind of him being silent in court and not making a defense of himself and things like that, really line up with the Jesus Ben Ananias story. So when Mark is writing his, he knew the Jesus Ben Ananias story, either from knowing it like anybody else did, or from reading it in Josephus's book, The Jewish Wars, which is where we know of it. Uh, ourselves, <clears throat> and then modeled his story using that person. Um, but of mm. course, that person wasn't even a Christian. It was just a random person whose story he liked politically, like the messaging of it, it was good for his narrative. And so he just used it and this hung on top of it, the pressure of Jesus, all the stuff that comes from scripture, uh, like the dividing of his garments, for instance, comes from Psalm 22 and, and things right. like that, a lot of other elements. Uh, and, and I think that's most of what's going on for stories of Jesus are scripture is just being reified into a story uh, or gospel teachings are being reified into a story. And I think there's good evidence. And I have an article on my blog on this, that a lot of what Mark does, and he's the mm -hmm. first one and everybody's copying most of what he's doing is take stories in Paul, which mm -hmm. are not even stories about Jesus. They're just Paul, uh, talk, Paul giving his own opinion, saying his own things, uh, and then putting them into the mouth of Jesus or turning, making stories out of them, putting Jesus in the story. Uh, to uh -huh. reify, basically take Paul's teachings and reify them into a mythic narrative, right? And have Jesus as the mouthpiece of the character. Uh, and there is a lot of evidence for this. It's, there's, it's a lot of odd features of the Gospels can be explained this way, particularly the Gospel of Mark, who was the one doing this the most. So what, I, I'm, I'm a little confused as to what the position of Paul would be, you know, Paul, because Paul's, doctrine was all written based on an alleged vision that he had of Jesus. Um, so do you think that Paul wrote the doctrine of what he believes he saw in this vision, and then the gospel writers took Paul's visions and then brought those to Jesus? I think they. what we can prove is they took his writings and his letters, which he mm -hmm. never actually describes his vision, right? Like he, right. Me he mentions it and refers to it and sometimes alludes to what he learned in it, but he never actually like describes it. There's no narrative. Um, it is possible that the narrative that ends up in the book of Acts mm -hmm. might actually stem from, might be an embellishment of an actual narrative that survived like an oral lore from Paul. The reason I say that only, and Acts is very unreliable. You should never trust anything it says. It, it rewrites Paul and rewrites history a lot, uh, mm -hmm. makes errors and so on. So I wouldn't count on it, but the vision to Paul is so weird compared to the way the visions the gospel authors write of the other apostles. And it mm. makes you wonder like what, first of all, why is it a different 
why is it so different and where do they get this idea from like so um i do suspect that there might be something to do like paul saw a light in the sky and he heard voices etc you know uh paul himself talks about hearing voices he had regular right. conversations with jesus in second corinthians 12 he talks about this like he jesus is inside his mind talking to him all the time right so uh and he thinks it's really jesus right so that that's or at least he's portraying it that way mm -hmm. the question that we would have for the, what you're asking though is to what extent does this stuff, uh, does the fundamental gospel and the pesher and all of this stuff come from Paul? Mm -hmm. Or to what extent is Paul just rip, ripping this off, right? Like, like it was it, it was come up by basically Peter and the first apostles were probably the original originators of this. Paul is an interloper. Like he comes in and like tries to like join the sect and become a leader in the sect and has to like finagle his way in. But mm. he's a latecomer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and supposedly was a persecutor. Like he talks about persecuting the church although he never talks about what that meant like what he actually physically did to persecute the church but he was known as someone who was harassing the church and then he, he you know flipped he had this vision and decided to join uh and, it's, and he came up with his own idea which was that we can convert we can adopt gentiles convert them to our sect without having them convert to judaism which was a huge innovation was not an idea of the sect before his him his doing it he had to argue for it he had to win people over etc but everything else I suspect he's getting from the original sect. So like when he talks about hymns, when he talks about the core gospel, when you look at first Corinthians 15 and there's a little like this, the basics of, you know, he died for our sins, et cetera, uh, all of that stuff. I think he's getting that from Christians before him. I think that was already a part of the sect. Uh, he himself like swears up and down that he didn't, uh, that he only got it from Jesus. Uh, I think that's, you know, a typical missionary you know, a bit of dishonesty. Uh, we've all run into this, you know, the, the, the missionaries and evangelicals and pastors who tell a story and then we know like that that story is totally bullshit, right? We mm -hmm. know that's not right. <clears throat> but I think Paul is doing that. I think he really got a lot of this stuff. And I think a lot of it originates with Peter and gang. I think Peter is probably the, the central founder of the sect and is the first to have a vision. He's the first to look to build the pressure uh, that is relied on and, and, and gets built into the gospels later. So you think Peter did have a vision of of Jesus or of, of, of a rising savior and 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 he's the one that kind of started it all? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the the best evidence we have it makes that the most probable, right? Of all the possibilities. Um and, and cuz Paul outright admits it, right? Uh, he mm -hmm. talks about it. And uh so I think that that's pretty good. Uh it, you know, there's a question of to what extent did Peter actually have a vision or claim to have a vision and this is an anthropological problem because we know both models exist you have joseph smith for example is someone who's claiming to have visions uh but we have other examples like you know the shakers and others where they ha actually have visions and they and your ap your apostolic status in the church depends on how powerful and many visions you have right so mm. uh, so some people could fake the visions but to do so you try to make them sound like real visions right so like mm -hmm. that's how they, so it's hard for us as historians 2000 years later to tell the difference, right? Those like, mm. you can't tell who's posing po for political positioning uh, to, to be able to have influence in the sect and who actually is schizotypal or fasting and having altered states of consciousness and actually having visions. We can't tell the difference at this distance, but we do know both kinds of things happen throughout history and throughout religion. So, uh, so we know both are equally likely. And so we can't answer that question for Paul or Peter as to how much they're really having visions versus how much they're just claiming to. Um, one question I have based on what you just said is, I know that there is a reference in Josephus to Jesus having been crucified. Um, do you think that that is something added that Josephus didn't write? Did Josephus think that Jesus was real or could he have been referring to someone else or, or where does that cut, fit in? Yeah. I he can't be referring to anyone else in that passage. So what we're talking about for people who are interested, uh, if you don't already know this, uh, folks out there, it's called the Testimonium Flavianum. And you can, there's a whole Wikipedia page on it. Uh, I've written about it as well. I have an article I would recommend people read on my site is you can't trust things on Josephus before 2014. That's not the exact wording of the title, but you put Josephus in 2014 in the search engine on my blog and you'll get the article. And I, I talk about the updating, and this is based on a presentation I gave at the Society of Biblical Literature Conference um, on the state of this. The question that you're asking is, is this a, an interpolation? Did someone just add that passage? Or was there something there that someone modified? Um, there are many different 
there's many debates in the field as to this. I think the evidence is conclusive. It was completely added. There was nothing there originally. Mm. I don't think Josephus ever mentioned Christians or, or Jesus. Uh, and this includes, there's a minor reference in a separate book uh, where there's a, a discussion of a particular person named James who gets uh, stoned to death. And there's a line in there that says he's the brother of the one called Christ. Uh, I think the phrase, the one called Christ, is what's called an accidental scribal interpolation where it was a scholar wrote that in the, in the margins just like as a, with a question mark, like, is this the story that we're looking for? And then a later scribe thought that that was omitted text and put it in. Uh, mm. and, and I actually, I, I have a peer reviewed article on this and it's in the Hitler Homer Bible Christ for people who are interested. I republished it in there. All, all of my peer reviewed um, journal articles I put in there on, on history, the subject of history. For people who are interested in that, I've, I've argued that. I also talk about it on my blog as well. So I think even that, that was an example where that was a different James. It wasn't a Christian James. Uh, the story has nothing to do with Christianity. But when you add those two words, suddenly it becomes a story about Christianity. And of course, only to Christians who would understand that, right? Like this, other readers would not understand what even Josephus was talking about at that point. But um, yeah, I think that got added later. And, and that might have gotten added before the big, the big passage in another book got added. Uh, so that's my take on it. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of debates in, in the scholarly field on it. And so people can deep dive that uh, further if they're interested. Okay, very good. All right, let's turn from history to a little bit more of the present. And I have a question on a recent blog post that you had. Um, in, in that blog, you said, every few years, I check what the top 10 books are in Christian apologetics by Amazon ranking. And what I've recently noticed is that Christian apologetics is in a state of intellectual stagnation or even decline. Seven of the top 10 are old, long refuted, intellectually terrible treatises measuring by current standards of philosophical sophistication and their ability to respond to the best work in atheism today or even indeed to the best atheist YouTube show. Um, why do you think this is the case? <laughs> um, it's important to note, and I do explain this in that article if people who want to, it's on the new Christian apologetics, is the, is the, that's in the title of it, if people want to look at that. I do point out that the sophisticated apologetics still exists. It's just not popular anymore. It's like it's, it's ah. far, far down the ranking, right? It's uh, people are writing it, some people are reading it, but it's not the stuff that's, that's being very successful. When, when I was coming up as, as a critic, a uh, counter-apologist in the 90s, <clears throat> the, the top leaders were people like J.P. Moreland and uh, uh, William Lane Craig, um, who were making much more engaged and sophisticated arguments. They're still wrong about things, but um, it was actually, it was, it was better argumentation, right? Uh, and and that, that's what I was looking at. And those were the top leading and everybody talked about them and they were the number one uh, things to look at. Um, you know, apart from, you know, C.S. Lewis has always been on the top, on the top 10, right, for example. But, uh, but there were like these authors were there, but now they've kind of like fallen to the deep hundreds or even thousands of ranking, right? Like they were far down. Um, and it's hard to find them now. In fact, one of the, one of my reasons for writing that article is to ask people, please give me your suggestions of like, recent Christian apologetics that isn't this terrible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's, it's also not just terrible. Like you have like um, evidence that demands a verdict is an old example of really terrible apologetics, but a very, very popular one. Probably the most popular Christian apologetics book sold across the world. Uh, and this is in the, the 80s, I think is when it hits its peak. Um, but even that is more sophisticated than what we're getting in the top 10 now. Uh, and I gave examples um, in, in the thing, there's only three new ones actually in the top 10. And Timothy Keller is one. Um, I can't remember who else. Uh, the, um, Farrar. Oh yeah. Um, hold on. I have it here. It's Hillary Morgan Farrar, uh, the mama bear apologetics. That's one of the top selling ones now. And then, uh, the other is uh, not Piercy. It's Oh, it's the, um, I can't remember the fellow's name, but there's a, there's a pastor who does uh, good video blogging, you know, short little video evangelism, um, but he has a book too. It, it, these are, but they're really terrible. The argumentation is very obsolete. Like it's 10 to 20 years out of date. Like, mm. so they're not, they're not responding to like the current status of debates. They're like going back to the eighties and, and not looking at anything published since, right? Uh, in some cases they're going back to like the early two thousands. And, not, and it's been 20 years since then, right? So, mm -hmm, you know, there, mm -hmm. there, there are, like I mentioned in the article, there are college students 
who weren't even alive <laughs> when some of these things first started being debunked and stuff. Uh, so, um, but yeah, they're, they're very deeply unsophisticated. And, and I talk in the article, give examples of what I mean by that uh, in terms of, so the question is why? Um, one common theme, at least in two of the three, is culture war uh, propaganda. So a lot of what they're doing, in fact, they, they sell these as Christian apologetics books, but really there's only like four or five pages in them that actually defend the Christianity against criticism. Uh, mm. Almost the rest of the book, and it's two of them, two of the three, two of the three new ones, almost the entirety of the rest is just about what Christians should believe about social issues. So they attack social justice, they attack gay people, um, you know, they, they, they attack various, uh, you know, the trans movement they're against. So it's all this culture war stuff. And that suggests to me that these books are aimed at Christians. They're not really aimed at convincing atheists. And that also tells you like the way that they, the, the poor research and the poor argumentation, and even in some cases, I think lying that we find in these texts, I think is there because they count on their Christian audience not to check. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're just giving them ammunition to try and keep them in the fold. And I think they're, they're, these books are designed, what we've seen, like one thing that's changed since the nineties to now is that Christianity is hemorrhaging people. Mm -hmm. uh, especially the youth, like there's massive outflux, like Christianity is declining in the United States. It's already been in decline in Europe and Australia and so on, but um, it's, it's been, been hitting a huge downslide, uh, particularly in the younger generations uh, in the last 20 years. And I think a lot of these books are a response to that, to try and, it's like a desperate attempt to keep people back, keep people in, uh, mm -hmm. and see people leaving, but they're not intelligent attempts to do that, right? So I, I, the example I give is that they don't go and ask any of these people who are leaving why they're leaving and then tailor their 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 sale to get them back based on what their reasons are. Instead, they give all these arguments that are they're already the reasons that these people have left, right? <laughs> and and this, it's like, you know, the example I give is like, there are so many like, oh, so many young Christians have come to me and say like, we're sick and tired of picking on gay people. Like, we don't care about that, right? We don't care about, like, abortion is not a big issue. Because we want to feed the poor. We want to do Jesus-y things. So that's the literal word, a phrase that one of them said to me. Uh, and um, so what, what is the response? Is the response is to get the hammer down more on all the hardcore conservative biblical stuff that is the very stuff that is driving people away from the church. Uh, and so this tells me that these people are not even really engaging in good market research. They're not really thinking intelligently about how do we solve this problem they have this armchair idea of what will solve the problem. And it's exactly the wrong thing. And it's, it's only going to make everything worse if they're, for, from their perspective. Uh, but that's what, but that's what's popular, right? So you have, it's these books sell to people who are worried about this problem and are not deep thinkers. Uh, and so, and eat this stuff up because it, it's exactly what they want to hear. It reinforces their belief. Uh, it makes them feel comfortable continuing to believe and staying in the movement. And that is its goal, I think, is the, the main aim of this literature. Whereas before, I'd say certainly in the 90s and the 80s, there was a strong emphasis in apologetics that was actual evangelism, is how do we convince atheists to be Christians? And so they were actually taking seriously atheist arguments against Christianity and saying like, well, we have an answer to that, like a legit answer. And we're actually, they would actually like pay attention to the arguments and evidence and actually respond to all the arguments and evidence, right? Rather than ignoring it all and just coming up with like really stupid excuses to continue believing what they're believing. And so I think that's what's culturally changed. And I think that's why we're seeing this decline now in, in what I call popular Christian apologetics. So there's still like the sophisticated stuff still exists. Uh, you can still find it. It's harder to find now. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm asking people to help me find it so I can do maybe a future blog on what's the good stuff now um, that, that's new in the last 10 years uh, and, and, and talk about that and not just you know characterize all Christianity as, as the popular stuff. But the popular stuff is important culturally and socially and politically. So uh, yes, it, it definitely. Definitely. It's been suggested to me by several people that they think Jonathan McGlatchey is one of the better uh, and more serious apologists of our day. Uh, any thoughts on, on McGlatchey? So uh, what I would want people to do is it, does he have a book uh, that defends I'm not sure. I responded to a couple of articles that he read. Um, right. I, I see him do articles on, on isolated subjects, and I've seen him do debates. Um, mm -hmm. I've even responded to one of his articles on the history of the city of Jesus. Um, but I, what I would want, what I'd want, is a book uh, that defends Christianity. So, like, if McClatchy mm. has that, 
I, I haven't checked um, because I am interested in this. Like if people think he's written a book that is a really good Christian apologetic defense, uh, certainly he's an upcoming name. Uh, so he's mm -hmm. a known quantity. Uh, so if he has a book, someone send me a recommendation. Like, yeah, this book is like the best defense of Christianity. Unless you've read it and it's terrible, then, then you know, tell me that. Like I read it and it's, it's terrible. But, uh, but if, if he does have a sophisticated defense, it's similar to what we're looking at Moreland and Craig and stuff in the, in the 80s and 90s. Um, I'm, I'm interested in that. So, so let me know if that's the case. If he doesn't have that yet, maybe he will come out with one later. I don't know. So uh, mm -hmm. people can always, if, if he does come out with one, people can email me and say, hey, you know, McClatchy came out with this book. Uh, I'm still interested in that. So I, I do want to keep track of what the sophisticated stuff is doing and saying. Um, but at this point, I'm not aware of McClatchy doing a, like a comprehensive defense of Christianity. Mm -hmm. I think I can answer for you one of the reasons why apologists um, do count on people not being fact checkers, and that is because of people like me. Um, I came to become a Christian in 1976, and the primary thing that held me in my faith and convinced me that this was right was Josh McDowell's evidence that demands a verdict. Yeah. And there's particularly one statement in there that that for me was so powerful and it would just drives me nuts that i finally found out that it, not only is it not true it wasn't even true when he wrote it <laughs> yeah, yeah which is that no archaeological find has ever disputed anything in the bible right and then i found out about kathy uh mckenna ken kenyon and her archaeological dig of of jericho and yeah, that that happened 15 years before McDowell even wrote that book. And I have to yeah. wonder, did he not know that or did he dismiss that because it wasn't a conclusive proof against the Bible? Right. I So oftentimes when you see lines like that, like that was a very absolute, you know, universal line, like no evidence there, that's usually backfilled by mm -hmm. an apologetic. Right. Like like they do. Well, OK, yeah, there's been some stuff, but. When you analyze it, it ends up not being evidence for against anything, right? Like so, but they're not saying that up front. Like they they want to like get you in with this with the this the big assertion, and then if someone comes asking like, yeah, but I read this Kenyan article, and I'm like, okay, okay, look, let's let's walk you through that. And so they've built an apologetic, and uh, evidence that demands a verdict, uh, especially the new one. Like there's there's the original, and then there's the new evidence that demands a verdict. Um, it tries to be very comprehensive, so like. Uh, it, it will have whole chapters with dozens of things that it's arguing against, like arguments against Christianity that it argues against, right? Like throws all these facts out. I can't remember how big its archaeology section is, but it's the kind of thing that they would do, which is they would fill in like saying, well, really, here's all of the evidence. Now, it also might be sometimes that they are excluding this stuff and hoping no one checks. And in the 70s, that was easier to do. Right. Um, yeah. So so now in the night, now in the, you know, the internet, like, you can, I, I designed this game in uh, early 2000s. I designed this game called History or Hogswallow. Mm -hmm. And it was for uh, uh, secular uh, students to, to do this game. And young students, so like high school and middle school. <clears throat> and it was all about, like, here are all these claims. And then half the claims were true and half were false, but all were ridiculous. And it was all about, like, how, how would you fact check these things? And they would come and say certain things and then we would have like cards that would come out based on, oh, I went to the library. Oh, here's what you find out. Oh, I do this. Here's what you find out. Um, I can't, that game is useless now. Because <laughs> the answer to every question is I would Google it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, so much information is available now. It's so easy to fact check things. And I do think this is part of the decline of Christianity is because of this. They've lost control of information and the narrative. Like they, they can't prevent their kids from just fact checking them on Google. Like there, there's nothing they can do, right? Um, so so I think that's that's a really important distinction. But but yeah, in the 70s it'd be a lot harder to like research this stuff. Exactly. The 90s, and, and and one of the things that I told people is even if I wanted to research that, what would I look for? If I went to the library and asked for a book on archaeological finds that have not been found, they'd look <laughs> at me like I was nuts. <laughs> yeah. All right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's go to I'll questions. All right. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I've, I've been holding questions. First of all, I wanted to bring up this comment. Atheist God, his second grandson was born today. 
Congratulations. Okay, oh, yeah. BS Not Accepted asks, when do you date the Gospels? Okay, um, I myself, well, I follow really the leading mainstream consensus, um, which is now, currently, it has actually shifted a bit in the last 10 years, but now uh, I, I do think Mark is late 70s because um, I think he's he's very concerned about solving the problem of the Jewish war. So he's got to be close to the Jewish war, but he's got to be after it. And I do think he's using Josephus's Jewish war, which was, that book was published in 76. So I think that puts Mark late 70s, right? Um, Matthew is clearly based on Mark, uh, but predates Luke, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and most scholars agree with that. There's arguments, but, but generally that's the, that's the view. That roughly puts Matthew in the 80s and 90s. And uh, we know the book of Revelation was written during the reign of Domitian, which is the 90s, because all of its symbolism and all of its hidden political uh, critique very much focuses on Domitian. You can, you can look at the, the number of emperors that it's using its allegory in there, and you can show that he's actually, someone is writing in the reign of Domitian to criticize the Roman Empire. Uh, and since it's very similar to Matthew, there's a lot of like borrowed phraseology and stylistic elements. Those are probably written around the same time. So I'm thinking like one was written before the other, so that puts Matthew 80s, 90s AD. Uh, Luke is clearly using the antiquities of Josephus, uh, which puts him in the late 90s at the earliest. And, and this is Luke and Acts, because they they it's a two-volume set. Uh, but most historians are putting it now like 110, 115, or maybe even 120. Wow. Uh, and one of the reasons is that Papias does not seem to know of Luke. And there's some respects in which you can show that Luke appears to be reacting to Papias, something Papias said about um, the, the preface of Luke looks like a sort of rhetorical response to a criticism Papias gave of the Gospels. And this has been discussed in uh, Two Shipwrecked Gospels by um, uh, Dennis McDonald, uh, for people who are interested in that. He has, and he has, he's written other books that cover this Papias uh, argument. I don't agree with everything he says about Papias. I think he's wrong about a lot of it. But I think this part is at least plausible enough that it's credible. But there are other reasons that scholars think that Luke is later, that later than the 90, late 90s. Um, and certainly we can't prove that he's not. This is the, the authors don't say, and we, we don't see references to them until late second century. So it's hard to like figure out when they were written. Now, John, our redaction of John was written in response to Luke. So that puts him later even. So it could be 120s, 130s. Uh, and <clears throat> it's also important to note that this is one thing that like, average people don't know is that even the leading experts on Johannine studies, the study of the gospel and letters of John, <clears throat> agree that our John is a multiply redacted text, that it actually exists in three layers. There was an original John, then someone came, someone else came along and edited it, took things out, added things, rewrote things, and then someone else came along and took things out and added things and moved things around and so on. So that ours is like the third redaction, and we don't have either of the previous redactions. And you can show this from literary internal textual analysis that something has happened, like people have removed things, they've moved things around and so on. Uh, there's stylistic differences and so on. So this is why people have come to agree that our John is not the original John, it's been multiply rewritten. And in a sense, the final redactor admits this when he says in the end that, that he's talking about we as, an, as the authors in the plural. Um, and so that we know, so even they're basically admitting that they're, that they're basing this on something prior. Um, we don't have the original, those earlier versions, and the earlier versions are harder to reconstruct, and thus they're harder to date. So when the earlier versions of John came out is less certain. Um, <clears throat> but our redaction of John is post-Luke, so uh, it's definitely got to be at, after the 90s for sure. Uh, and so that, that's how I date the Gospels. Um, that's pretty much on the vanguard of the mainstream consensus now. There's a lot of disagreement, and, and people will add ranges of dates instead of just trying to peg the most probable date. When I pick these dates, that's the top of the bell curve, right? I think that's the most probable. And then as dates from either side span out, it gets less probable. Uh, is, so, this, so you can talk about them as ranges of dates, uh, but I think the most probable dates are the ones that I mentioned. Okay. Next question we have is, did Eusebius inherit Origen's copy of Josephus? Yeah, uh, literally. Um, I write about this on my article on the James passage in Josephus, uh, which is, again, in Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. Um, yeah, because uh, it's the library. So Origen started the library of Caesarea. Um, and so he accumulated, so he, the manuscript of, his manuscript of Josephus would have been in that library. That's when he was using it and referring to it when he responded to Celsus. Uh, 
Um, his library was taken over upon his death by Pamphilus. And then after Pamphilus died, Eusebius took over the library. So you, it's, that's why it's Eusebius of Caesarea, because he took over the library of Caesarea. So he's using the exact same library. Um, he might not have had the exact same manuscript because that's like a hundred years of difference. And it's possible, if not likely, that this that got copied and then the old one thrown away, right? So that, and it's in that copying that it could have been interpolated and modified and stuff. So a lot of people find a lot of the, the for example, the Testimonium Flavianum is very Eusebian in style, like suspiciously looks exactly like something Eusebius would write. It doesn't look very much like what Josephus would write. Uh, the stylistic markers lean Eusebius, not Josephus. So a lot of people have accused Eusebius of forging it and then lying about it. I think it's possible Pamphilus did it and Eusebius was duped. Uh, and, and it's possible because Eusebius was the student of Pamphilus and might have inherited some of his style. Uh, so so the, the, the things that we're seeing that are Eusebian style might actually be Pamphylian style. But we don't have any of the writings of Pamphilus, so we can't check that. So, so I think either of those are possible. So what you see base is looking at, is he looking at the actual manuscript that Origen would have annotated? Like, is it the actual one? Or is he looking at a copy of that that might have been redacted that we don't know? But we do know that he's using the exact same library. So it's either a copy of that manuscript or the manuscript itself. So, uh, and I think that's important to note because all extant manuscripts of Josephus derive from the Eusebian manuscript. We have no manuscripts mm. that survived from any other library. So anything that happened to that manuscript or that, that textual tradition will be in our manuscripts. We won't be able to check. There's no manuscript we can go and check and see, oh, this is a pristine version that came from a different library. We don't have any of those. They all come from Eusebius. So uh, that's, a, that's a bit of a problem in terms of trying to untangle some of these questions. Okay. Next question. Do you believe it's possible that a pre-existing angel, whatever name it had, got fused with a historical figure, an average first century Joe, for, uh, an average Joe first century rebel? Uh, so if Jesus existed, I think that had to have happened, right? So uh, already right out of the gate after his death, the Christians are talking about him as this pre pre-existent, and even the, not just the pre-existent angel, but a specific one that we have a discussion of the, 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 the logos, the um, high priest of the celestial temple, the image of God. There's all of these phrases that apply to a particular angel uh, that we know about in the literature. So they clearly thought, so let's say Jesus existed, they clearly thought that that guy was that angel incarnate. Um, so I think that's indisputable. So even if Jesus existed, that's what they believed about him. Um, and but when they believed, when they came to that belief is a whole other question. Did Jesus himself go around claiming that? Uh, or is that something that they made up after he died to kind of rationalize his failure in a sense, right? So um, there's there's different models that make sense, um, but definitely that something like that has to be the case uh, if, if, Jesus, if there was an actual person. Okay, this is an interesting question. How old does a claim have to be to be considered history? <laughs> Oh, wow. That's a good question. I don't really, that's a philosophical question more than anything. Um, <laughs> because you know what happens in between is journalism, right? We usually, mm -hmm. we talk about journalism and then there's sort of blurry line between when does journalism become history? Uh, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, it, in the simplest sense, immediately is the answer, right? So like uh, when Tacitus is writing the annals, which is the, the history of the Roman emperors before him, um, he references, he says one of the things he used was the memoirs of one of the, uh, the women, one of the leading imperial women. Uh, she wrote this really important set of memoirs uh, that Tacitus gets a lot of his information from. Well, these memoirs are just her reminiscing about her life, right? So the things that she experienced and so forth. So really like, and that might even started like the day next day, like she might've started writing notes down immediately. Uh, so already that history is being made in a sense. And then when she publishes her memoirs, which would have been like later, um, that's still only going to be like 10, maybe 20 years after the fact in some cases, maybe only if a couple of years after the fact, like towards the end of her memoirs, right? So like her memoirs might publish just a few years after the last event in them. Um, so yeah, like right away uh, is the answer. Thucydides, of course, is the father of modern rationalist history. He's writing like he was in the war, right? And so he's like writing about this war. Uh, and he comes up to almost like, we think literally his own day, like he, the reason it ends where it does is we think he died 
mm. you know, in the middle of writing the last book. Uh, and then Xenophon, who also uh, was involved in that, like picks up and continues the history after Thucydides on the same the same day or year. Um, so yeah, like right away, it would be the answer uh, is history. But nowadays we have a whole profession called journalism that has its own uh, methodology and standards and so forth that, that kind of stands in between so that historians often rely on journalists. But there are a lot of historians who do the work themselves directly. So oral historians, for example, is important. The, um, the project to preserve the oral history of the Holocaust, for example, that is being conducted by folklorists and oral oral history specialists. But it's, it's historians who are doing this, right? This is They're the ones applying their skills and their, their knowledge, and they're the ones interested in getting this done. They want all this, this video taken. They want all this depositions taken now before these people die right uh, mm -hmm. and so um so that's an example of how how it, it starts right away uh, basically okay next question what probability do you give for the hypothesis that jesus was a popular ap apocalyptic preacher who was i'm not sure propag pro propagandized i guess he means propagandized might be yeah um well, the highest highest odds uh, would be in the vicinity of one and three, uh, and I only say that because that's the top end of my margin of error for Jesus existing at all. And I think the apocalyptic prophet model, um, a, a particular version of it, but nonetheless the, the model in general, is by far the most likely model of historical Jesus. Um, lately, there's been a push for the zealot model, or uh, sometimes people hate that that's it's called that, but the militant Jesus that gets whitewashed as a pacifist later. Um, I don't think that's plausible at all, uh, but it is actually like there's serious peer reviewed scholarship defending it. Um, I think, but I think that's so much less likely than the, the standard model. I think Jesus is going to be a lot like these other messianic figures that Josephus talks about. This is all the rage to have these guys come along and claim to be the new Joshua who's going to reconquer Israel with powerful miracles that replicate the miracles of Joshua and bring upon the end of the world. Like, so these are guys who are all, I, I think Jesus would make most sense as one of those guys. Like he would fit the model like perfectly, even with the information we have. Uh, and, and I think it shows that there was this trend historically so that the prior probability that Jesus would be one, another one of these guys, I think is the highest of all the options that we have. Okay, one last question, and then I'm going to give you a chance to plug anything that you want might want to plug that you have coming out. Um, last question is, did Christianity spread because they promised life after death? Uh, in part, um, they weren't the only ones selling that, right? So mystery religions were selling this. Uh, this was already personal salvation with missionaries going around selling it was like dime a dozen there are like six or seven of these religious movements christianity is actually a latecomer uh it's it's the first one to take the jewish culture and create a version of it all the others we had a thracian culture version we have a greek culture version we have an egyptian culture version uh we have an anatolian culture version we have a syrian culture version uh so all these different national cultures came up with their own personal savior cults with missionaries and the whole deal christianity is the first jewish one and it's basically the last one. I don't think any others were invented. Um, there's been an argument that Mithraism started slightly after Christianity. That's the Roger Beck argument. Um, and that's plausible and possible. And that would then be the Persian version. So that's another national culture turned into a, a savior cult. Um, but whether it started before Christianity or after, it's just another one of these. Uh, and that's what Christianity... So it's already it's entering a market that's already flourishing, it's, which means the product sells, right? Uh, mm -hmm. so, um, so the question you would want to ask rather is what made Christianity more attractive than any of these others? Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. that's been the, the difficult question to answer the, the big problem is that in the fourth century, it got imperial endorsement basically. And so like literally money was looted from pagan temples and shifted over to Christianity for political purposes. So by that point, like there's a whole political reason Christianity was chosen, uh, and, and, and that's different from the actual, and by that point, the Christianity that's being sold looks nothing like the Christianity of Paul, right? It's been massively transformed, uh, has different dogmas and, and, and a whole different structure, like institutional structure and its goals, everything's changed, uh, by that point. So the earlier on, I think the, the thing is that there was already an appeal to Judaism. I think people liked aspects of Judaism. We hear this reference to Gentiles who like crowded around and were basically fanboying, uh, 
uh, and fangirling Judaism, but they didn't want to, like the men at least, didn't want to like cut off a piece of their penis and didn't want to follow the dietary rules and so on. So they would basically hover on the edges of Judaism but could never become a Jew. Well, when Paul came up with the idea that you could join this sect, which was basically a Jewish sect, without becoming a Jew, so no circumcision, no, no dietary laws, well, that's going to be, they had a market already waiting, just like people like literally crowded outside the door waiting to buy this ticket, right? <clears throat> so, so that's why Paul had a really marketable product right out of it. He, he had a whole bunch of people who were already waiting to buy this, but no one was selling it. And so he comes along and sells it. So I think, and that flooded the church with Gentiles, which is what led to its huge shift towards a Gentile religion, becoming more anti-Semitic, pushing out the Jewish, the original Jewish elements. And the original Jewish sect died out within like a couple centuries, right? It didn't last very long and dwindled uh, severely. <clears throat> um, but yeah, so I think that's what did it. And then at that point, uh, you know, Rodney Stark has done a sociological analysis. He's a sociology of religion. Uh, he's a Catholic now. Um, and But he did analysis showing that you can show with the evidence. And I talk about this in chapter 18 of my book, Not the Impossible Faith. I talk about all the evidence of Christian growth and the numbers. And he shows that the number, the, the rate of growth is the same as every other evangelical religion in history. Um, Mormonism is his main model, but you can look at other uh, religions that have grown. They, they grow at the same rate every decade. Um, until they hit market saturation, whatever that happens to be. And for the first few centuries of Christianity, it's growing at the same rate as any other religion. So uh, uh, it's basically just, you know, you know, some people like apples, some people like oranges. And so some people went Christian, some people went Mithraist, some people went, you know, uh, Adonis worship, some people went Addis worship, and so on. Uh, so people just basically picked the one that they wanted uh, to be in. There were certain things that Christians were doing that might have been more marketable like they were they were selling it more cheaply um like the buy-in was less like they were they were, they were focusing more on gaining members than conning them out of their money that changed later but uh but in the initial movement they were mostly uh basically socking money off of the rich members mm. but not begging too much money from the poor and they were using the poor coming in to prove the success of their movement to get the rich people in Mm. Right. So that, that was their strategy originally. So it was less like that when you look at Osiris cult, for instance, we see that they were there was a lot of monetary buy in to get through the levels of initiation. So it was very much organized around you got to buy your way up. Uh, and in a sense, Scientology is kind of like that. Uh, so it's the more wealthy you are, the more money you give, the higher ranking you get. Um, mm -hmm. When Christianity started, I think it was very much a sort of egalitarian communistic cult. Like it was against that model. Um, mm -hmm. It was still getting money from the wealthy, but it wasn't like uh, ripping off the poor at first. By the time you get to like the third and fourth century, it's been completely reinstitutionalized. And now it's like trying to find ways to get money out of everybody and, uh, and so on. So it's kind of gone back to the same model as everything else did. But when it first started, I think it was popular because it was an easy buy-in. It was a cheap buy-in. The, the cost was the social cost in terms of you had to give up your family for this new family. You had to adopt their particular rules, but the rules weren't particularly onerous. Um, right. So like it was, it had certain sociological attractiveness and Rodney Stark's book on this is mostly correct. There's some things he says about Christianity that I think are not necessarily distinctive of Christianity, but his overall idea that there's sociological choices they made that made their, their market, their product more marketable. Um, might have helped, but it still it grew at the same rate as everything else. So it, it wasn't that much more marketable. Um, and really it only became a world religion because of Constantine making that political decision in the end. Okay, very good. Before I uh, engaged Dr. Carrier for this show, he had let me know that he only had one hour for us. And so I am going to continue the show and I will discuss the comments that are in the chat. But um, before we let Dr. Carrier go, I'm going to ask him if he's got anything he wants to plug. And there is one set, question here that I think you're going to want to answer, which is what book that you have written would you most recommend that everyone should read? Yeah, um, yeah, I'll answer that in a moment. Um, yeah, the storm hasn't come in. I, I had mentioned earlier that we've got a huge, huge snow, like a really vicious snowstorm coming. Um, and I have to drive my dad down to like some medical appointments and stuff. Uh, so that's, that's why I gotta, <clears throat> I gotta buzz out and get down the mountain and back up the mountain before the blizzard starts. Uh, but yeah, in answer to that question, I wrote a blog called um, Guide to My Books. So mm. if you go to my, and this is where I would recommend everybody start, is richardcarrier.info. That's richardcarrier, all one word, dot .info. There That's is a link website. to, 
there's a link to your website in the description. Cool. Yeah, that's my website. That's that links to everything. So if you want to take online classes with me, uh, the link is there. If you want to follow my Facebook, uh, if you want to follow my Twitter, if you want to if anything else, if you follow the blog, you want to buy my books, all the stuff, it's all linked in there. You can find it with the menus and so forth. But one of the things you can do is search it. There's a search engine on the, on the right margin of my blog. And you can look for a guide to my books. And then that goes through all nine books I've written and, and very briefly talks about what's in them and why you might be interested in them. And I recommend that because everybody has different interests. Like, so what it is that you want to start with will relate a lot to like what you personally are most interested in and have the biggest questions about. And it could be philosophy or it could be history. It could be Christian history. Or it could be history of science because I've done ancient science stuff. Um, so all of that, that, that is a really quick read and really just shows you like, what are these books? And then you can pick uh, from there. That, that's the best way to answer that question for people. I also did a guide to my social media. So if people want to know, should you follow me on Facebook or should you follow me on Twitter or subscribe to my blog? Like well, what things do you, do you want to do? Um, my guide to my social media explains what each thing, what I do in each thing. And then you can make your, your decision from there. Um, and that's, that's basically all I would, I would plug. Uh, I, you know, I love it when people will help support my work through my Patreon. So, uh, you could, you can find on my website and basically pay like a few dollars for every blog I write. And then that helps me continue doing what I'm doing. Uh, and that's what allows me to be an independent scholar and write blogs. I do four blogs, four paid blogs a month. Uh, and they are substantive. I'm one of the few people left doing long form blogging. Uh, and so if you want to support that kind of stuff, you can go through my blog and see if it's the kind of stuff you want to support uh, and check that out. Uh, and then, like I said, the teaching, I do the online courses uh, that you can find through there as well. And then buy my books and, and anything else like that. Thank you very much. I appreciate so much that you were able to come and, and, and uh, spend a little time with us. Yeah, it's been great. Uh, good questions uh, and uh, good talk. So I, I'm glad I came on. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, and for those of us who are remaining, I'm going to start with um, some of the comments that have been coming in. Uh, let's see. Uh, Led asked the question, do Christians still use Josh McDowell? And the answer is absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, Sean McDowell, uh, yeah, Sean McDowell and Josh McDowell uh, just re-released evidence that demands a verdict uh, updated for, for the current current age. Logan Fisher asks, does do sex have tex? I think that was was more of a joke question, which is why I didn't bring it up. Um, and Logan also brings up the curtain towering in two from top to bottom. Um, I thought that was uh, an interesting comment because in the debate with Bart Ehrman and um, uh, Mike Lacona, Mike Lacona uh, said that that event is, was not a historical event, but rather was a portent, that, that this was more of a literary device that, uh, I can't remember which, which gospel, that oh, it was in Matthew, that's right, it was in Matthew, um, which to me was an absolutely shocking comment because I'd heard so many sermons on how important that was, that this was a huge event that showed that God had torn away the veil that separated man from himself. And, and then to hear an apologist say, no, that, that actually never actually happened. So that, that was quite interesting to me. Uh, another comment that we had was from Kristen Hood, who said a pre-existing angel, some say the Old Testament angel of the Lord revealed the story of his crucifixion to Paul through a pesher. Um, Paul definitely seems not to know that an earthly Jesus, not to know an earthly Jesus when he says that he first appeared to Peter rather than to the women at the tomb. Yeah, that's, that is a contradiction that's, that's always stood out to me as well. And I've heard plenty of apologists say that, oh, well, they, they just mean that both of them happened and but yeah, um, and Melody's right, or either that he considered the women not to be worth mentioning, uh, which is some of the conclusion, the conclusion that some of the apologists that I've talked to uh, have mentioned as well. Uh, Paul says nothing about the ministry of Jesus and doesn't appeal to Jesus' teachings when it would be logical to do so. Okay. Okay. 
uh, Melody Joy says that she also uh, listens to Mama Bear Apologetics. I have heard of Mom Mama Bear Apologetics, but I've never really listened to it. I think I will have to give a listen to one of those since it's obviously something that's rather popular. Uh, when I listen to sermons and other apologetics, it sounds like they're talking to children. Yeah, I agree, Melody. You know, you you are absolutely spot on with this one, um, and that's something I've brought up in a few of my videos. Is that uh, uh, some of the things that apologists, not even when they're talking to atheists, but when they're talking to their own people, they sound like they're talking to children because they bring up such such simplistic things. Uh, and Logan Fisher says, Church HR needs to see you for your exit interview. <laughs> uh, that's funny, Logan. Okay, now I need to try to start catching up on the comments that have come in. Uh, let's see. Ultimate Reductionist says, I'm not a big defender of humanities at all, except for hard care, hardcore historians like Dr. Carrier. Definitely need to keep historians well-funded doing the hard work they do to keep counter-conspiracists. Very good point. Very good point. Because you know, conspiracy theories abound in our country today. And unfortunately, we, we saw this with the 2020 election. And some of the things that the far right was, was saying and claiming was true and um, listening to Jordan Klepper interview people, some of the crazy things that they were saying, I, I, I just couldn't believe that anyone with even a half a brain would say them. Jay Rainey says, interested in Dr. Carrier's take on Israel Anderson. Um, sorry, we, we didn't get to that one in time. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see. Okay, Kristen Hood brings up uh, Dr. Carrier's book, Jesus from Outer Space. I ah, can't talk now. Jesus from Outer Space, a great starting point for his mythicist books. Uh, and Kristen Hood also says, Not the Impossible Faith is a good carrier book for those into counter apologetics. Thank you, Kristen. That is a very good uh, recommendation and one that I will probably take up myself because I am very much into counter apologetics myself. Johnny Rapine says, being a Christian means never having to say you're sorry. Isn't that the truth? Uh, um, John, I know exactly what the issue was with, with Dr. Carrier's lighting. Um, uh, Dr. Carrier is on the West Coast, and the place that he was, he was sitting, he had natural lighting on one side and artificial light on the other, and the sun went down while we were talking. And that was why, why his lighting kept getting worse and worse. Is that was the sun going down. Uh, Logan Fisher corrects Johnny Rapine saying, Christians say they're sorry all the time. It just means you never have to mean it. Uh, Let's see. Limited Light says what? Infowars? Yep, the, that is definitely some of the crazy stuff we were hearing in uh, around the time of the 2020 election. Glad to see that show go. At least I hope it's gone. Okay. I was taught it was very important too. tearing of the veil separates the Old and New Testament for many Christians. Kind of scary if you think about it too long. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, hearing that, that that never really happened was great. Greetings, Purple. Um, 
you can, even though you got delayed, you know, you're always, always welcome to go back to the beginning and start again from the beginning. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for the shout out, Edmund Sat Sat Satter, Sater, Sat Sadler. There we go. Okay, the big takeaway is that there is no sign of the earthly Jesus from Christian writings before the Jewish War of 66 to 70 CE. These documents include 1 Peter, 7 authentic ep epistles of Paul, and 1 Clement. Yeah, that is that is quite a revelation that, uh, that there really isn't any sign of an earthly Jesus prior to, the, to that time. Okay, Limited Light asks, so who knows what Bayes' theorem is about? I do not. So if anyone else does and wants to explain that in the chat, I will bring up your comments and uh, and we will take it from there. Granny, thoughts if Earth is flat or round? Dr. Carrier says it's not flat, but having a top secret previously in the Air Force flying health altitude, you two aircraft say otherwise. I definitely don't agree with you there. There's no question that the earth is not flat. That was proven millennia ago. Uh, Logan asked, no mention of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Um, yeah, we did not get to that, sorry. Okay, and we are caught up on the chat. And I had originally asked uh, Kitty if she would join me uh, for the end of this show, for the portion after Dr. Carrier had left. And unfortunately, Kitty uh, had to go to the hospital. And so I do not have her to talk with and, and discuss what, what Dr. Carrier had to say. Um, that would have been nice, but unfortunately that didn't work out. Uh, okay, Limited Light says, I have taught on Bayes' theorem, which Dr. Carrier used, and on my educational channel, I have some videos about it. Okay, very good. We will have to check that out, Limited Light. Thank you for that information. Okay. BS Not Accepted says, Erastosthenes calculated the circumference of the Earth 2,500 years ago. Until someone else pretends to be Q or has some super secret squirrel level clearance. <laughs> yeah, um, if, if the Earth being flat was some kind of... Um, super secret it, you know there would have to be so many people paid off that it, we wouldn't have any money, money left in the, in the world uh, limited light says this handle is not under my educational channel okay go ahead limited light and let us know what your educational channel uh handle is so anyone who wants to find out a little bit more information about that is able to do that Okay, with that, um, I am now caught up on all of the comments that I wanted to bring up as well. And um, I, I, I really don't have a whole lot else to say. I really enjoy Dr. Carrier being a guest here, and I hope that you did too. I hope to have him back again uh, in a couple of months, and uh, maybe we can explore some of these, these other questions that we didn't get to today, particularly um, on Bayes' theorem. Um, and uh, thank you all of you for coming and joining me. It has been a pleasure. And those of you who are watching this in the future, um, thank you for coming. Uh, things that I have upcoming this week, I am doing a video in response to Lydia McGrew, uh, who is a doctor of, uh, she's actually a doctor of Ed English, but she does her work in apologetics. And so that's why I'm take, uh, doing a, uh, a video on her. She does an interview with Sean McDowell, but I'm also featuring a couple of her other videos to explain some of her points. Next week, my guest will be Marla. Um, Marla is one of my new patrons, and 
She is a member of the LGBTQ community. Um, she also has a fairly similar background to mine in leaving the faith. And so um, I'm going to have her on to talk a, a little bit about her, excuse me, about her journey. And then um, beginning in March, I'm going to be moving my live stream from Tuesdays to Saturday afternoons. It will be Saturday afternoon at 3.30 Central Time, and that way we can be a little bit more friendly to having some of the people from across the pond on uh, as guests as well. Um, the very first week of March, I may have to not have a stream that day, so... Um, if you, don't, if you don't see me that first Saturday at March, there, there's another event that I might have to go to. And right now, I don't know if it, if it happens, what time it will happen. So um, uh, let's see. Okay, limited light. I'm going to head, I'm going to go ahead and make you a mod so that you can post your uh, let's see. There you go. Okay. Limited light. You are now a mod. And so you can go ahead and, uh, post a link to your, uh, your educational channel. Can I give an example of Mark riffing on Paul? Um, actually, no. Sorry, Luke. I really can't. Um, that would be would have been a great uh, that would have been a great question for Dr. Carrier, but unfortunately, um, I uh, I did not ask him in time, and and he has gone now. No limited light. I did not make you a temp mod. I just I just made you a mod. Um, so if you want to ever come back and uh, post something on another video, you'll be welcome to do that as well. Okay, with that, thank you everyone for joining me. It has been a pleasure having all of you here. I hope you enjoyed this show and I hope I'm able to bring you more content like this in the future. And until next time, everyone, live your life.